Hello there, vinyl community. Welcome to a uh, pretty sunny Sweden and Sundsvall. And today it is election day here. And uh, we are going to vote for a new government. And uh, I have just recently uh, been coming back home again after doing my democratic duties. So now I felt it was time to do some responses. I am shooting a couple of movies now. Uh, a couple of them will be viewed at a later time. Uh, but right now, first of all, it is uh, a response to the real James Croxton uh, and his 250 subscribers contest. Congratulations, James. 250 subscribers. Uh, I hope I will reach that one day. It's really, really great. And uh, you had a very, very interesting contest, I, I think. Uh, you wanted us to, uh, you wanted us to uh, compare uh, different bands and their uh, lineup changes through the years. And uh, uh, I have put together five examples of uh, lineup changes. Uh, all of them are connected in one way or the other to the 80s. Uh, and uh, many of them are, are also very interesting when it comes to the results of, of the bands. Uh, I think it's pretty obvious in most of the cases that it didn't went all that good. Uh, all of them are also the biggest, are, are also a change of singer. Uh, which, in my opinion, often is the biggest change because the a singer's voice, of course, is very much connected to the band. And if you change that, it might change the entire band's image or, or uh, style or something like that. Uh, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. Uh, to start up, uh, I'm going to take an 80s band that uh, I don't know how many of you Americans who know this band, but here in Europe they were pretty pretty big in 1987. They had a string a quarter of fine 80s hit singles. I don't want to be hero, Shattered Dreams, uh, the main title of, of their the title track of, of their most famous album, Turn Back the Clock, Heart of Gold, great 80s, really soft 80s pop tune from from, uh, from Britain. I really, really love, love that band. It's called Johnny Hates Jazz. Uh, and uh, the singer during their most successful year were this guy, Clark Dachler. A really smooth voice that goes well with the with the with the sound. Uh, and um, to me that is uh, Johnny Hates Jazz. At their best but uh, in 1988 at the end of that year he uh, had a feud with the other band members and he left the band and uh, the problem was how are they going to follow up a success without their singer so uh, they really started to uh, to search high and low for a band uh, for a singer that uh, actually uh, reminded as much as possible of, of the Clark Dachler and they found they found uh, this guy Phil Thornally uh, who in the voice uh, sounds very very much like uh, Clark Dachler and if you look at the, the videos from their second album Twelve Stories it, it also resembles a lot in the face of, of uh, Clark Dachler. They really tried a hard work to find someone who uh, looked just like uh, the first singer. Uh, the problem was that no one actually bought that. Uh, the hit singles was a failure. The album Twelve Stories really isn't a good album it is uh, you might say that the, the it's still in, in the great so, so, really soft production uh, soft uh, pop music but the melodies are are uh, totally invisible and, and uh, uninteresting it sounds more like uh, those songs that didn't uh, make it on the first album uh, 
they had to take it on, on their second album, but there were no hit singles at that actually. And Phil Thorne Alley sounds like a really cheap version of Clark Tatchelor. And I have read some interview that where uh, Phil Thorne Alley himself has said that the three years he spent with John Hayes Jazz were definitely a big mistake. And I think that he will have an agreement from most of us 80s fans actually. So John Hayes Jazz, what Clark Tatchelor? Or Phil Thornally, in my opinion, Thornally gone. Clark Dashler is the best choice. Uh, the next band is maybe more connected with the 70s, but they had uh, a little little success in, in the 80s also. Talking about the Commodores, uh, who of course is most uh, famous for having Lionel Richie as a singer. They had some really really good soul hits from uh, released on at Motown. Uh, three Times a Lady, uh, I'm Easy, uh, really great, great uh, tracks. Uh, and this is moving on from 1975. Uh, and uh, they had some great funky stuff at, in the 70s. But uh, when the 80s began, Lionel Richie had become so successful that he started to, uh, that he quit Commodores and went solo. And for him, of course, it was a good choice because he became what he became. For the Commodores, on the other hand, it wasn't all that good. Uh, they, they, the new single, singer were J.D. Nicholas, uh, who isn't a bad singer, singer and uh, uh, they had a minor hit with this one, Night Shift, with uh, little, their celebration, their, uh, they wanted to do a song to, to a prim premiere uh, guys like Marvin Gaye and Jackie Wilson and this is a good song, it's, it's really a good song I let the car pass by so it won't disturb me uh, but the problem is that uh, it, it isn't uh, anything special the special feeling that a Commodore song has it, it, it doesn't uh, uh, feel unique uh, J.D. Nicholas is a good singer but, but he sounds like you're Average everyday soul singer. It isn't hasn't that special uh, soft voice like Lionel Richie had, and uh, um, wasn't a big success like they used to like it used to. J D Nichols is still singing with the, the Commodores of today, actually. But Lionel Richie or J D Nicholas in, in the Commodores, my choice is of course Lionel Richie. Uh, the next example is a band that I'm not all that huge fan of, but they have done some really good songs, especially from this album one that I'm going to show right now. I'm talking about the Electric Light Orchestra, and they did some really good songs on Ballads of Power. That is some interesting tracks also in the 70s also, but some of them are, are a little... Uh, I heard them way too much. But Calling America and So Serious are really great 80s singles uh, and uh, <laughs> I have mixed feelings when it comes to the singer Jeff Lynne. Uh, Jeff Lynne is a totally boring producer I, I feel today. Uh, so predictable. You can hear in a mile, uh, you can hear miles away when, when uh, Jeff Lynne had produced. Uh, and it sounds stale, it sounds uh, boring. Uh, and uh, especially when he in the 90s produced a lot of those these older guys uh, from uh, the hit charge from the past uh, and uh, it sounded very very boring but he is also a very special singer for Electric Light Orchestra he, he is very connected with it and he became very unique for that and um, you can't deny the fact that the uh, influence that he had on this band. So uh, it is an interesting and great singer even though he's a dull producer. Uh, then later on he quit the band and uh, Electric Light Orchestra were taken over by uh, Bev Bevans. But the problem was that uh, Jeff Lynne owned the rights to the name Electric Light Orchestra. So Bev Bevans had to change the name a bit. Uh, it is uh, promoted as a uh, new band, but in, uh, I know that this could be a little discussed, but I, I 
I uh, take this as a uh, continue of, of Electric Light Orchestra, even though they were calling themselves Electric Light Orchestra Part 2. It's just a name change to, to uh, keep the fans, actually. Uh, so, uh, they were releasing an album, Electric Light Orchestra Part 2. And in 91, this single came. It's the only physical uh, song song in physical format that I have with this ELO part 2 released on disc. I find that that is a proof of how low budget ELO became because disc is a label famous for their very low budget uh, collections. Uh, but uh, this was a good song I thought actually. It was a great melody and pretty good production but the problem was that it sounded more like a uh, uh, a cover band for EL, the original ELO uh, wasn't the same productions uh, because uh, Jeff Lynn wasn't behind it. It's produced by Jeff Glickman, uh, and uh, it is uh, not the same. Uh, Bev Bevans isn't a bad singer, but he is. Uh, uh, he sounds totally uninteresting, in, uninteresting actually. So uh, ELO part 2 was a failure and uh, it is, sounds more like a cheap version of ELO. So Jeff Lynne or Bad Balance and even though he's boring I choose Jeff Lynne. Now we come to a band that I'm not going to, uh, a couple of bands that I'm not going to talk that all that much about because I'm going to do some, do a video of them uh, in my two from one series uh, that I started in the last video. Uh, but there are also good examples of this. Uh, Chicago, first of all who uh, is most famous for having uh, Peter Cetera. This is Hot Streets from 1978. Uh, Peter Cetera, who were their lead singer in the 60s and 70s. Uh, and uh, I remember as a child I didn't like Peter Cetera's voice at all. It sounded, sounded uh, like a wimp, I thought. But, but uh, uh, I realized uh, later on that he was a really, really good singer in Chicago. So, so uh, I changed my mind big time. Uh, but uh, in 1986 he wanted to go on his own. He had released a solo album before. But now he wanted to do more solo albums. And uh, he uh, asked the other band, band members if uh, it was okay if he released solo albums and uh, Chicago albums separately. And they said, no, we want you all to ourselves. And then uh, Pizzatera said, then I quit the band. And he turned the mic over to a guy that uh, was already a member of the band. Uh, he had sang on uh, their album tracks before. Uh, and uh, it worked pretty well then. It was a smooth uh, crisscross between the singers to, to have someone who had actually sang on the album before. I'm talking about Bill Champlin. Uh, and uh, it wasn't all that big success until uh, this album came, the number 19, and a single called Look Away, who is a really good uh, single, no doubt about it. Uh, I like them, but in two different ways, uh, which I'm going to talk more about in, in my two from one video with Chicago. Uh, Bev Bevan, uh, Bev Bevans, I'm still stuck in the ELO. Uh, Bill Champlin is a really good singer for Chicago. I, I don't have anything against him. Uh, I think Look Away is a great single, for instance. And, and uh, they became more rockier, more of a normal power rock ballad band uh, from being, being a, smooth pop band or jazz rock band before uh, and uh, as I said Bill Champlin isn't a bad singer but Bill Champlin or Peter Tierra and even if I do like Bill Champlin as a singer Peter Tierra is more Chicago for me uh, he has that special voice that had formed this band no doubt about it I was going to say that the Chicago singer today is Robert Lamb, who is one of the original members. Uh, I haven't heard all that much with Robert Lamb as a singer, but the little I've heard isn't is uh, 
nowhere near neither uh, Bill Champlin or, or Pizzotero. So, so uh, I'm not going to count him in, actually. Uh, the final band is a band that I like very, very much. Uh, and I sh said that before, talking about Ultravox. And Ultravox, of course, is uh, the singer is Mijior. And uh, I'm a huge fan of Mijior. He has a special little spooky voice with some echo effects. And I really like him. He is, uh, has a great voice for the music that he sings. And he has... Uh, uh, literally uh, put his mark with his voice on, on uh, the Ultravox and, and the Ultravox sound. So uh, I uh, like him very, 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 very much. Uh, which, uh, of course, made it a little more sadder when he quit the band in 1987. In 1993, uh, Bill uh, Curry tried to uh, put together a new Ultravox. And uh, they, did, they did that with uh, himself as the only uh, really famous Ultravox name. And they had a singer, Tony Fennell. Uh, and they released this album, Revelation. They also had released an album after that called Ingenuity with the singer Sam Blue. I don't have that album. Uh, and uh, to be quite honest, I'm not sure that I want to have it, but I realized that I gotta have it for to complete the Ultravox collection, but I'm I'm not sure that I, I, I'm looking forward to listen to it, because Ultravox without Majeure didn't work at all. Tony Fennell is not a bad singer when it comes to his voice, but it isn't Ultravox one bit. Uh, the melodies doesn't sound Ultravox one bit. Uh, Tony Fennell is a very anonymous singer, uh, and uh, I haven't heard Sam Blue, but I fear the worst, actually. So, uh, I this album I have mer barely for, for uh, the collection. I, it's definitely... Uh, before I heard Ingenuity right now, it is the, the worst Ultravox album ever. So, I guess it's pretty clear where I stand. Vince Jure or Tony Fennell? Uh, I say, of course, Vince Jure. Tony Fennell goes away. So with that, I hope that you're satisfied with my answer, James, and uh, the rest of you also, of course. And uh, now I will see what kind of results, what kind of uh, government we will have here in Sweden. So with that, I'm going to say, uh, have a nice one. Bye-bye.